Okay, thank you, Iftak, for the introduction. Thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me. I told them I have no reason to result in cryptography or lower bounds to talk about. So I said, it's okay, you can tell us about an old result. So that's uh, what I'm going to do. This is from before laptops, so I will uh, use the board. <laughs> Uh, so they say, the setup is, suppose we have some uh, uh, permutation, some uh, budgeted function. So here, uh, Hellman proved something that is uh, generally an impossibility result for lower bounds. Like he showed that there is something that can be done that I mean, it's not exactly an algorithm, but it, uh, it puts limitations to what you can argue is impossible. So he, uh, he had the following idea. Maybe two else. Uh, so you can, uh, you can construct a data structure that uses Uh, roughly uh, S bits. Let's say this bijection is computable in, ta in polynomial time. Uh, using which F can be inverted with a speed up that is of the order of roughly of the space that you're using. Okay. And his idea that probably uh, almost everybody here has seen before, it's easier to visualize by thinking about the graph that has two to the n vertices, one for every input of the function, and then you make this a directed graph by putting all edges from uh, x to f of x. So then this graph will be a collection of cycles. Uh, the idea is easier to visualize if it's only one cycle, but otherwise you do what I'm describing here for uh, each of the cycles. So your data structure will simply uh, be a list of uh, nodes in this graph equally spaced along this cycle. If there are multiple cycles, you will do that one for each cycle. Uh, so that those points are a distance two to the n divided by s from each other. Okay. So maybe you can call this x1, this is x2, and so on. So since you space them by two to the n divided by s uh, steps in uh, this cycle, there will be only s points in your list. Okay. So the data structure is just uh, this list, x1, x2, up to xs. So then how is this helpful in um, inverting the function? So suppose someone gives you a point y, uh, for which you want to compute the inverse. So what we will do is just to compute, uh, to walk along this graph. So we will compute f of y, f of f of y, and so on, until we hit one of those points in the data structure. For example, here we'll uh, move a few steps. We reach here. And then we go back to whatever was the previous data structure element. So modulo s. So here, we will go back here. So maybe at some point, this is equal to one of the data structure elements. So we will go to the previous one, and then co continue to walk from there. So then, eventually, we will get back to y. The step before y in this walk will be the inverse of y. So how long did it take from uh, we basically walk the uh, length of the distance between uh, two consecutive points in the data structure. 
because we worked from here to here and from here to here plus this back edge. So the total number of times that we computed f was n, uh, 2 to the n divided by s. Uh, multiplied by whatever time it takes to uh, compute f in a forward direction. Okay. What about the database What about the database lookup? Well, uh, this contains uh, s elements, so it could be another log s time, uh, which will be less than n, because s is less than 2 to the n. Uh, it could even be, mm, yeah, that's right. OK, so. so uh, Obviously, to compute this data structure, it might not be, might not be possible to, to do that in less than 2 to the n time, because you do have to, uh, to find those points, you have to compute this f iterated 2 to the n over s times that it's not clear you can um, uh, do any faster than computing f over and over. But the, uh, but say, if you're considering, if you're analyzing security for uh, a fixed size crypto system, um, and then you want to make some assumption on the security of the underlying primitive, the security cannot be based on uh, the efficiency of uh, algorithms or Turing machines for this fixed size function. Because there will be an algorithm that, um, solves the problem very efficiently because maybe the whole lookup table of the fixed size function is part of the code of the algorithm. So an appropriate definition of uh, security for uh, fixed side functions will uh, either use circuits as a measure of complexity or will have sort of two measures of complexity going along, which is how long is the code of the algorithm and uh, how big is the running time of the algorithm. And uh, this poses some limitation to how good such assumptions can be. Because it says that every bijection from n bits to n bits has a Boolean circuit, like once you implement this data structure as part of the circuit, of size roughly square root of 2 to the n. And uh, like in general, if you say take this measure of uh, program size and program complexity as sort of the same order of magnitude, that also cannot be any more than square root of 2 to the n. Uh, so this does pose some limitation to even what can be stated or assumed about the security of uh, fixed side functions. Even though so the kind of programs that are implied by this are not programs that we would be able to find and construct efficiently. So there are some ways of uh, mitigating this, like looking at families of functions and uh, the, so with some uh, randomness into them. And then for most choices of the randomness, the function can be assumed to be harder than this. Uh, but it's also, uh, I think, a very good question to ask whether once you have this kind of non-trivial attack, possibly a non-uniform model, or in a model in which you trade off program size and uh, running time, whether you can do even much better than this. Maybe uh, instead of the time being 2 to 10 divided by s, maybe it could be 2 to 10 divided by s squared, or uh, even less than this. Now, to prove now an actual lower bound on uh, arguments of this type, we cannot do that for uh, efficiently computable bijections, because maybe p equals np, so the whole, uh, everything can be done in uh, polynomial time. So uh, instead, we look at what happens when the bijection is given as an oracle? So we will just charge one for a computation of uh, f in the uh, forward direction. And a particularly interesting case will be when f is random. Although that's not the only case of interest, because this gives also a sense of what can be assumed in the random permutation oracle model once you understand that you can also use similar ideas to argue about the random function model, the random oracle model in the standard sense. Okay. okay, so something of this form was already 
proved in the uh, work of uh, Yao on uh, data structures. Uh, here I'll uh, present a version of this algorithm from uh, uh, joint work with uh, Rosario Gennaro. And our argument is kind of flexible, so for other applications, is based on a compression, it's a compressional uh, argument. Uh, So we'll, uh, our argument will be of the following type. So suppose that f is some uh, bijection, and at this point, uh, it's not really important to think about bits anymore. We could just think of it as a, something mapping the numbers from one to one to the numbers from one to one. And this is available as an oracle. And then suppose that A is an oracle algorithm. Um, such that A with oracle access to F, given F of X, finds X. So A is an inverter. In fact, it's also quite interesting to look at the case in which this is an inverter that just uh, breaks the one-wayness of f. Uh, because in that case, if that's all you want, you could do uh, Hellman's construction on only uh, an, a sort of sub-interval of uh, this cycle of length epsilon times to the n. So the running time, instead of being 2 to the n divided by s, will be epsilon 2 to the n divided by s. And you could also ask whether this is optimal. Okay. But, uh, so in general, the argument will say, well, suppose we have this bijection available as an oracle. We have some uh, oracle inverter. Uh, then we want to say that uh, using A, we can find a compressed representation of f. meaning shorter than log of uh, n factorial bits. Now, if f is chosen as a random bijection, it cannot be compressed by more than a constant number of bits, except a small probability over the randomness of f. So however many bits this representation is shorter than log of uh, n factorials, those bits have to be into A. So A uh, must contain an amount of information about f, which is at least the difference between uh, how much we can compress f and uh, how much is the best possible compression of f without any additional information about it. So to prove the tightness of uh, Hellman's result, we would like to say that it, so again, we cannot make, we cannot prove lower bounds on the time that A uses for a certain amount of uh, space storage, but uh, we can prove lower bounds on the number of uh, oracle access to f. Oracle access is to f. So to prove this tightness, we would like to say that, um, that the compression saves about 2 to the n over t bits. Where t is the essentially the complexity, time complexity of uh, A. So essentially any algorithm that is able to invert F using T oracle queries must contain at least 2 to the n over T bits of information about F. And so it has to 
kind of contain a data structure of size at least two to ten divided by t. So uh, such a result would give the tightness with uh, Hellman if there is this epsilon in the inversion probability, you would still like to be able to say that here you are saving two to ten divided by t times epsilon if present. Okay. Okay. So indeed we present such a compression scheme. So I will uh, show you how it works. Yeah, this is with uh, Rosario Gennaro from about 2000. Okay, so here is the uh, basic idea. Uh, let's think of um, F as a perfect matching between uh, two uh, sets of vertices of size to the Right, so my uh, idea will be, so let's for simplicity think about the case that A inverts F everywhere, but then it will be clear what you do otherwise. So the main idea will be that given A, it's possible to specify F on only some subset of the inputs, and then you can recover the unspecified subset of the input just from A and from the specified set of inputs. All right, so here is uh, how you can do it. So I'm going to mark the inputs that I will uh, not specify in the compression. So this will be essentially the space that I save in the compression. So let's call, say, this lexicographically first possible output uh, Y1. So I will, uh, I will not specify what is the output of the pre-image of uh, Y1. And this is kind of, this is okay to do if A, uh, when given an input the pre-image of uh, this Y1, let's call it X1, sorry, A, when given an input uh, Y1, makes only oracle queries that are uh, specified in the compression. Because then, A will do its computation and will uh, invert Y1. Okay. So, so, so what is it uh, in the compression? It might be that uh, you plot some exclusive uh, or some functions of the, of the base or... Oh, for sure, but uh, I, I'm going to show a lower bound on the amount of information in A, so I need to just show an upper bound on uh, uh, sort of how short I can make a compression of F. So I just need to show a way of compressing F. So my way of compressing F will just be to <coughs> specify it only for a subset of the input-output pairs. And now I sort of want to explain what is this subset of input-output pairs on which I will specify. The input-output pairs that I will mark in yellow are the ones that I will not specify. Okay. Yeah. Right. So if I I'm going to uh, not specify this input-output pair. Then I'm going to run A on input Y1 and see what are the oracle queries that it makes. So maybe it makes uh, these oracle queries. Okay. So then I keep in mind that these input-output pairs must be specified. How do you put Y1? What? How do you determine what is Y1? Y1, just a lexicographically graphically first. Uh, it's, all, it's all zero string. I have the code of A. Uh, this is the compressor. The compressor knows everything. No, 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 no. Uh, A, you have Oracle access to F. A, uh, you have the you have the code. Okay. A could be uh, randomized. So let me get to that later. For now, let's say A is deterministic. Yep. Okay. So then uh, I will get to the lexicographically next. Uh, possible output of F that I've not already decided to keep or not keep. So maybe I'll uh, uh, look at this. Uh, 
so then uh, I will run A on uh, this input and determine what are the uh, inputs on which A uh, queries F when it's trying to invert it here. And I will mark them as definitely keep. So then I will go to the lexicographical next string that I've not decided yet whether to keep or not and so on. It is a worst case uh, bound number of queries, yeah. Although you could still do, especially in the epsilon case, you could do a Markov uh, a type argument and say it's no more than twice, yeah. Why do you mark the x's in the model and not the y's? Maybe the x will want to be kept for some way. Oh, uh, like uh, what I'm marking are input-output pairs uh, because the specification of the function will be a collection of input-output pairs. So when I decide that I need to keep a certain uh, input, uh, I sort of know that the, I have to also specify the corresponding output. So the output will not be something I can save. Because when I have an A, I could have an A that whatever decides that it wants to invert, it also just checks this conversion. You see what I mean? Let's say it inverted my one, it did all these other queries, it got X1, and then it will query F on X1, just because that's how I specify my output. Would you now mark X1 and Y1 as well? Uh, no, so if, if A uh, queries the inverse of the thing that it receives, I uh, don't mark it. In the simulation, if I'm seeing that I'm querying something that I don't have in my set, I know that that's the inverse because it's the only exception. Uh, then, uh, uh, so, uh, so I, I, I'm choosing kind of these uh, right strings one after the other. Uh, every time I choose one, all the, um, ah, sorry, you're saying if uh, for this, uh, yeah, that's fine, because then in the decoding, I will try to reconstruct these strings in the lexicographic order. So by the time I'm trying to reconstruct one of those strings, I already know all of those. Okay, so, um, so this has specified a collection of uh, input-output pairs such that if I don't uh, say what f is on these input-output pairs, I can uh, reconstruct all those values by the use of a. Okay. So how many input-output pairs I've marked Basically, every time I chose one that I'm allowed to drop, and then maybe I mark T of them that I must keep. Maybe fewer than T, because some of those were already uh, kind of chosen before and can be ignored. So this set, uh, I don't know, let's call it B, this set of uh, things that can be ignored, is of size at least uh, two then divided by T plus one. For epsilon equal one, yeah. Uh, otherwise, I will do the same, but um, of those that I, and again, I'll think of A as being de deterministic, for each of the, the only Ys that I'm allowed to mark uh, for deletion are those in which the inversion succeeds. Okay. So in that case, there will be an extra epsilon here, because I have epsilon times two to the n input out of pairs that I'm allowed to choose from, every time I choose one, I might have to commit to T others to be kept. So that's uh, right. So now this means that uh, in this case, F F is completely described. by this set B um, I guess I'm thinking of B as the output so B it's set of uh, pre-images and then uh, what is F restricted to Okay, maybe I'll call this C. Uh, what, 
what is uh, f on the on the specified pairs on the complement of uh, these sets. Uh, so now I can sort of uh, try and see what, uh, what I'm getting. But intuitively, uh, I have specified fully f without saying what 2 to the n over t input output pairs were like. So I should be expecting to save about 2 to the n divided by t bits of information, uh, times epsilon if this only succeeds with epsilon probability. But actually, there is a little bit of uh, a problem, which is that, for example, for every um, bijection, I can fully specify the bijection without telling what about square root of 2 to the n input output pairs are like. And um, the reason is sort of annoying. Um, so let's think of uh, the elements of the bijection as integers from 1 through n, because again, bits are not very important. All right, so this sequence, f1, f2, f3, fn, must contain either an increasing subsequence of length root n or a decreasing subsequence of length root n. Now, suppose that those are the non-specified input-output pairs, but I specify what is the function on uh, the remaining pairs, and I'm also telling kind of what is the domain and codomain that I'm uh, skipping. Well, then everything else is completely determined because the output will, with one more bit, that tells me whether the unspecified outputs are increasing or decreasing. Okay. So it's not so simple. Like, it's not that if I don't specify a certain subset of inputs, automatically I am compressing the function. Uh, but it turns out that if I do this, it is true that A must contain, like doing the calculations of uh, how many bits it takes to specify B, C, and uh, F. Uh, in the end, you get something like uh, N over T of the order of uh, N over T times log of uh, n over t square. So I think that's, uh, that's right. Unless f can be compressed beyond the Yeah, so the uh, uh, bits of information. Yeah, so. Yeah, so if you have a bijection for which 2 to the n over t fraction of inputs can be left unspecified, and I can reconstruct the rest, uh, this non-specification is saving me at least uh, n over t times uh, log n over t square bits of information. So this information has to be into the inverter. Not, not entirely, uh, because... So, if t is less than root n, then we are getting n over t. And uh, that's right, that matches uh, Hellman. But if t is more than root n, you don't get anything. And uh, you shouldn't, because if you're trying to, uh, so think about this. When uh, t is more than root n, your data structure will be of size less than root n. And then you can leave root n entries unspecified and get them to be implied. But this is the problem of the, this is the suboptimality of the compression algorithm. It's not the, the right bound. So then there is one, um, yeah. Okay, so what should be tight is, uh, is this. And uh, this is right, but you have to change the compression just a little bit. Okay. 
So I, although I think I'm out of time. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just uh, uh, explain it. So, um, so I want to describe two algorithms, the compressor and the decompressor. So let's say the decompressor knows A, the compressor knows F uh, and A. So the way I was describing it here, this was sending over this set B, this set, uh, okay, so maybe let's call it C, F of C, and uh, F restricted to uh, uh, this subset. Okay. So instead we'll do uh, uh, something slightly different. Um, let's see if there is a... So first, we're going to choose a random subset on the right-hand side of density one over t. Okay. So we choose a set R of uh, cardinality about two to the n over t. Okay. So this will be some uh, blue uh, vertices. Now I'm going to do uh, my construction by only choosing from, it, it, this will be epsilon to then divide by t in the um, sort of incomplete inversion case. Then I'm going to construct my set of elements that I'm going to be able to discard, not as arbitrary subset of the right hand side, but just as a subset of this random set R. So what is the uh, advantage of this? In terms of size, things are about the same. Because now, uh, when I choose one element from uh, uh, the set R, on average, I'll only have to remove one element from R. Because I pick this element from R, I look at what are the queries that I make. I'm making T queries, but R is random set of density one over T, so maybe I have to remove one element. So this can be sort of made uh, uh, more rigorous, but roughly the set that I get, it's uh, the same size. And you don't have to describe R. R can be like a public parameter. Yes, and now R can be shared randomness. And now this means that f of c, I just need to describe f of c as a subset of R. Okay. So this saves me a little bit, that before, to describe f of c, I was spending, um, two to then choose two to then over t. Now I'm only spending uh, two to the two to then over t. Okay. Like in terms of bits, now it's uh, log of uh, two to then over t. Before it was that, with sort of an extra thing. And what is that extra thing by me? That here I get t instead of t square. Uh, it, it's a, a very small gain, but it's exactly what uh, makes it tight. Okay. So, uh, and so this is the, uh, the lower bound. If, uh, uh, with an extra epsilon, if there is an epsilon here. If A is able to do this inversion, it must contain at least this amount of information, which is really enough to do Hellman's. Okay. And the compression argument here is that uh, if you have some shared randomness between a compressor and a decompressor, it doesn't take away from the fact that all the entropy, in, like all the uh, entropy of uh, F has to be communicated in this way, except whatever was in the mutual information that A had about F. Okay, thanks a lot. Ah, in the randomized case, uh, you could uh, just uh, make the randomness be part of the shared randomness between compressor and decompressor. Uh, but then when I talk about the quantum case uh, later, there is also another way of dealing with it uh, that's more similar to what happens in the quantum case. Uh, but here you can just put it in the shared randomness. Uh, no, but to fix it for uh, what is the best, you need to no f, and then the decompressor needs to know what is the right randomness for f, and that requires information about f. Yeah. So you have this issue with, uh, with decreasing or increasing the subscripts, but uh, that's only in case of bijection. Like, would the basic idea work for uh, a random function, not the random bijection, or is there also some saving? 
uh, I would expect also a random function to have a, ah, uh, mm, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't remember if we had a ex bad example or not. Uh, 